Hey, everybody, and welcome to the Five Bytes Podcast. I'm your host, Rory Monahan. Coming up on this week's episode, a roundup of this month's Patch Tuesday news. Microsoft announces end of support for Windows 10 21H2. And it has been a horrible few days for Microsoft on the security front, including a vulnerability that has been disclosed that has been exploited for six months and an update on the recent breach of Microsoft by a Russian affiliated cyber gang. For this and more, keep listening to this episode of the podcast, which of course, as always, is brought to you by my sponsors, and that includes ControlUp, end-to-end digital experience management for the work from anywhere era. ControlUp, happy users, happy IT. And also brought to you by Networks Policy Pack, where you use Group Policy, Policy Pack Cloud, or MDM to remove local admin rights, manage lockdown applications, Java, browsers, and mitigate ransomware, plus more. And of course, also brought to you by Numescent, the inventors of the first and only cloud-native container management platform for Windows desktops. If you enjoy the show each week, give these awesome sponsors to thank. And now for some news. It was Patch Tuesday once again, and this month Microsoft updates are patching 60 vulnerabilities. That includes 24 elevation and privilege vulnerabilities, 3 security feature bypass vulnerabilities, 18 remote code execution vulnerabilities, which is significant, six information disclosure vulnerabilities, six denial of service vulnerabilities, and two spoofing vulnerabilities. Interestingly, for this month, there are no zero days being patched. One of the elevation of privilege vulnerabilities is CVE-2024-21400, and this is a Microsoft Azure Kubernetes Service Confidential Container Elevation of Privilege Vulnerability. This one could allow attackers to gain elevator privileges and steal credentials that not only affects the service, but also resources beyond the security scope managed by Azure Kubernetes Service Confidential Containers. And as I alluded to, there's 18 remote code execution vulnerabilities being patched this month, which is pretty high. So while the headline is not there that, whoa, you know, three zero day vulnerabilities patched this month, there is still enough there that's significant, you know, 24 elevation of privilege vulnerabilities, 18 remote code execution vulnerabilities. You don't want to sleep this month like any other month. Uh, You want to get testing your patches as soon as possible. Usually the fallout from patches occurs over the next week or two as people test the patches, but there is one early issue that was detected. Several people in the patching Google Mail group have pointed out KB5035849 on Windows Server 2019, and that patch was failing to download with a 0xD000034 error, but it appears that Microsoft has already swooped in and fixed this problem. And as is usually the case, other vendors, you know, such as the likes of Adobe, have also released their own security updates in line with Patch Tuesday. So be sure to check out the updates from all of your major vendors. Microsoft has announced end of support for Windows 10 21H2 is coming in June, when the Enterprise and Education Editions reach their end of service. Once the end of service date is reached, systems running Windows 10 21H2 which is also the Windows 10 November 2021 update version, will no longer receive monthly quality updates encompassing bug fixes or patches addressing newly identified security vulnerabilities. So, you know, if you're not getting security updates, don't stay on that OS version. Uh, Please make sure you're updated to a supported version. It has been a rough week for Microsoft in terms of security stories. Several outlets, including Ars Technica, reported hackers backed by the North Korean government gained a major win when Microsoft left a Windows Zero Day unpatched for six months after learning that it was under active exploitation. So it seems like a major miss by Microsoft. The vulnerability, listed as CVE-2024-21338, was leveraging the AppID.sys, which is part of AppLocker, And this provided an easy and stealthy means for malware that had already gained administrative system rights to interact with the Windows kernel. While Microsoft released a patch for the vulnerability, they did not mention that it was being actively exploited for six months as they published the advisory and the fix. So there are those in the community who feel a little salty at Microsoft because they didn't acknowledge the fact that it's been actively exploited for so long. Also in the rough security stories for Microsoft category, recently was reported that Russian-backed hackers 
who breached Microsoft's corporate network in January, have expanded their access since then in follow-on attacks that are targeting customers and have compromised Microsoft's source code and internal systems. The cyber gang responsible has been using the proprietary information in follow-on attacks not only against Microsoft, but also its customers, which I mean was the case a few weeks ago when this was first coming to light. There were other Microsoft partners reporting that they were being breached related to this breach of Microsoft in conjunction with this breach. And Microsoft, for their part, has stated, quote, It is apparent that Midnight Blizzard, which is the gang, by the way, is attempting to use secrets of different types that it has found. Some of these secrets were shared between customers and Microsoft in email, and as we discover them in our exfiltrated email, we have been and are reaching out to these customers to assist them in taking mitigating measures. Midnight Blizzard has increased the volume of some aspects of the attack, such as password sprays, by as much as tenfold in February, compared to the already large volume we saw in January 2024. Midnight Blizzard's ongoing attack is categorized by a sustained, significant commitment of the threat actor's resources, coordination, and focus. It may be using the information it has obtained to accumulate a picture of areas to attack and enhance its ability to do so. This reflects what has become more broadly an unprecedented global threat landscape, especially in terms of sophisticated nation-state attacks. End quote. It's interesting that they actually highlight that some secrets were being shared between customers and Microsoft in email, which seems like a bad way to be sharing those secrets. So maybe that's something they're going to address further. You may also recall when I covered the initial story of this Microsoft breach, it was suggested at the time that the gang was mostly just trying to find information about itself on Microsoft systems. And there were subsequently stories of other companies getting breached after that breach, I believe like HPE or DXE or someone like that. There were subsequently stories of other companies getting breached after that breach as well, and it seems like that's maybe ramping up too. At the time, I said that I felt like this story was going to grow. Well, that is certainly the case, but I feel like this may be burying the lead too, and there's going to be significantly more. The fact that they've attained the source code will certainly be a test of the zero trust philosophy that Microsoft has been evangelizing and recommending to others. So this is going to be an interesting year as this story develops, I feel. Parallels has launched its Parallels Browser Isolation, which is a secure web access service designed to prevent growing threats of cyber attacks and data breaches within an organization. The service is integrated with Parallels Cloud, Desktop, and Legacy Workspace solutions. They say it's easy to set up, it can be set up in just 10 minutes, providing easy management and a user-friendly web portal and quick time to value. The press release states that the isolation introduces many unique capabilities and benefits, including secure streaming from an isolated browser container, fast setup in less than 10 minutes with no learning curve, predictable pricing, it isolates web browser from the endpoints, safeguarding them against malware and threats, agentless and browser-based, so it's suitable for all devices and browsers of choice, managed or unmanaged. It's easy to administer, and there's real-time and historical insights on actions and activities of users and administrators. Parallels Browser Isolation is now available with annual subscriptions and monthly billing plans. The suggested retail price for a one-year commitment is currently 19 US dollars per month paid annually, though as is usually the case with enterprise products, there are going to be some price breaks, discounts, and also the ability to bundle. So Parallels is getting into that secure browser space that the likes of, I think it's Island.io, Citrix, and others are currently in. A member of the Lockbit ransomware gang has been sentenced to four years in prison by an Ontario, Canada court after he pled guilty to eight charges, including cyber extortion, mischief, and weapons offenses. BleepingComputer.com reports he was an important figure in the gang and was part of several high-profile attacks worth over $100 million. In addition to the imprisonment, he was ordered to pay $860,000 in restitution to his Canadian victims. He also faces extradition to the United States, where he will face additional charges. The same article I'm referencing suggests the gang which is the Lockbit ransomware gang, is possibly currently limping along. An analysis of their new data leak site, remember, if you, don't, if you listen to the podcast, 
you may recall that I cover the fact their data leak site was breached by the authorities and they pivoted and set up a new data leak site and were apparently operational again very quickly after being breached. Well, this new analysis indicates that most of the newly posted data on their new leak site is for companies that were attacked in 2022 and 2023, indicating that the gang may be trying to appear busier than they actually are. So that would be interesting if it is actually affecting their business because the indications like a week or two ago was that it did not really affect. So I guess we'll see. BleepyComputer.com this week reported that Google awarded $10 million to 632 researchers from 68 countries in 2023 as part of their bug bounty program. This is $2 million less than in 2022, but as BleepyComputer.com suggests, it is still significant. The highest reward for a vulnerability report in 2023 was reportedly $113,337 while the total tally since the program launched in 2010 has reached $59 million. The Register has reported that a group of cloud infrastructure providers in Europe has delivered an ultimatum to Microsoft, which is essentially end what they call an unjustified feature in pricing discrimination against fair competition or face legal action. The complaint laid out how Microsoft discounts its own software when bundled with its own Azure cloud services, meaning it's more expensive to run Microsoft's software in rival clouds. It was reported that Microsoft offered to settle, but the offer was deemed to be paltry. However, negotiations are ongoing. In the article, a couple of examples for cost comparison are used, including running SQL on Azure versus rival clouds, and interestingly, Azure Virtual Desktop with multi-session Windows 10 or Windows 11 versus trying to support the same number of users on other DAS platforms on other clouds that do not have the multi-session OS option. So essentially showing that to support 32 users over on maybe Google Cloud Platform, you need to have just a regular Windows 10 and maybe 32 machines one-to-one -one for each user versus on Azure, you have the option to run multi-session OS and have like three machines to support 32 users. Honestly, I mean, if you listen to the podcast regularly, you'll kind of know some of my thoughts on this. I feel like this is just a matter of time. It seemed like a glaring omission when there's been all of these claims of anti-competitive practices against Microsoft, that this has not been raised until now. And it being raised now after the two largest vendors in the space have been acquired, Seems like trying to close the gate after the horse has already bolted, but I guess better late than never because this will serve customers, not just these other vendors, if it does get remedied. A review into the saga at OpenAI a few months ago has determined that the prior board's actions stemmed from a breakdown in trust between the board and CEO at the time, Altman. It was found that the decision to fire Sam Altman was made in undue haste, Quote, the prior board implemented its decision on an abridged time frame without advance notice to key stakeholders and without a full inquiry or an opportunity for Mr. Altman to address the prior board's concerns, end quote. Altman's surprise firing occurred after he attempted to remove Helen Toner from OpenAI's board due to disagreements over her criticism of OpenAI's approach to AI safety and hype. Some board members saw his actions as deceptive and manipulative. After Allman returned to OpenAI, Toner resigned from the OpenAI board on November 29th. So there were trust issues between the CEO, Sam Altman, and the board. The board took the decision to oust him, but we all know how that ended up. Well, that's it for this week's news. Now let's get into some scripts, tricks, and tips. First up, I believe it was just this week that the new Mastering Microsoft Intune book has been published. And this was authored by Christian Brinkhoff and Per Larson. The subtitle is Deploy Windows 11, Windows 365 via Microsoft Intune, Copilot, and Advanced Management via Intune Suite. So it seems like Intune is more relevant than ever. Uh, so this is going to be a book that interests a lot of people. And the awesome Ruben Sprout shared a new hexagrid and white paper that provides a detailed overview of the end user computing ecosystem. The white paper explores the EUC hexagrid 
An in-depth, the white paper explores the EUC hexagrid in-depth, offering a unique, never-before-seen view of the EUC ecosystem. So if you haven't seen it, it's a really, really impressive infographic. It's got so many different vendors and so many different areas of EUC illustrated on it. It contains six main pillars and 26 sub-pillars, with more than 226 vendors listed on it. So if you're in the EUC space, definitely check that out. But that's it for this week's episode of the podcast. Thank you all so much for listening.